there are few updates in this week and i'm going to talk about it first one is update on russia ukraine conflict the bakhmut update bakhmut has become a new stalingrad of this war this is a city of logistic logistics and strategic importance and it has turned into a meat grinder Rus- russia has encircled bakhmut after nearly a year of bloodiest battle in the russia ukraine conflict just like stalingrad and could turn or could be a turning point of the conflict just like stalingrad nato secretary general jens stoltenberg has acknowledged that bakhmut will fall into russian hands in coming days he also said that its capture by the russian military would necessarily reflect any turning point of war translation it probably is a turning point of the war <laughs> russia fired dozens of missiles at kiev and other reg- regions across ukraine overnight striking civilian infrastructure the, the, this is recent striking civilian infrastructure and the country's defense industry is in one of the biggest barrages this year as its forces continue to claw more territory in the east general valery zaluzny the commander in chief of ukraine's armed forces said that russia had launched 81 missiles into of different varieties from air land and sea in addition to eight iranian attack drones four of the drones and 34 cruise missiles were in, in, intercepted general zaluzny said missiles hit western ukraine as far as lviv which is rare now 40% of kiev population is without heating kharkiv or kharkov is now without power water or heating it has come to my understanding that that there are about 60000 ukrainian troops that are training in the nato territory for the upcoming russian offensive they are preparing for Russia's 300,000 to 500,000 troops that that was supposed to come into the battlefield in the winter last year but winter wasn't as harsh last year as usual without the ground freeze they would have suffered logistics issues so that offensive will probably come in spring it is now called the spring offensive also there are a few thousand us soldiers in eastern europe along with polish soldiers undergoing training so the fighting between russian mobilization with ukrainian and nato soldiers in ukrainian uniform will happen in spring or it probably will happen in spring this can escalate big putin being a dictator must win to appear strong and competent otherwise he'll be overthrown or killed biden after afghanistan humiliation will not want to back down as election se- season in us will begin soon also understand there was a war between continental europe and russia in 19th century after napoleon became master of europe there was a war between continental europe and russia in 20th century with hitler's invasion of soviet union now in 21st century continental europe and russia are extremely close to a war Russia has won the last two wars but at a huge cost to Russia there are major differences in the last two and in this one if it escalates here are the issues that will affect Russia negatively first the biggest global power in last two wars britain was on russia's side against napoleon and hitler this time the biggest global power usa will be the one waging war on russia with continental europe second russian federation lacks the manpower to match nato unlike tsarist russia or soviet union russia has one of the biggest demographic crises after the collapse of soviet union it lacks young people here are the issues that negatively affect that will negatively affect nato if this escalates into a war first NATO needs to set up a log- the logistics of the war. 
It needs to move weapons, soldiers and supplies near Ukrainian borders. This normally takes months. Do they have that time to set up the logistics before the upcoming Russian offensive? Now, they have many NATO soldiers stationed in Poland and Romania. NATO weapons to Ukraine are coming to Western Ukraine from Poland. But will that be enough for a war between NATO and Russia? Second, NATO's, NATO's ammunition problem. This is related to the first problem for NATO. Ukraine gets its ammunition from NATO. Reports on the ground and rumors on the internet tell me that Ukraine is firing less than 10,000 ammo per day, per day, possibly less than 5,000 ammo a day, while Russia is firing over 20,000 ammo a day. This is either a day or a week. I don't remember which one. I think it is day. NATO has to move into war economy to get its production up as soon as possible to surpass Russia to ensure victory which takes weeks if not months the war, war economy transition. Third, NATO's public is largely disinterested in war. Poland and Romania might be the exception. It's the elites in the NATO, particularly in Washington, that want a war with Russia. Now this is a disadvantage and advantage to both NATO and Russia. They have nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles. If the nuclear war starts or the war between continental Europe and Russia, then Russia, Europe and North America gets destroyed. Not to mention the environmental disaster that will affect the rest of the entire world. But this is all hypothetical, I hope. Right now, all things considered, Russia has the upper hand over Ukraine. It will be up to Ukraine and NATO to decide how to respond to the upcoming Russian offensive. Let Ukraine fall and get humiliated and potentially fall of NATO or NATO enters and escalates the war against Russia which will probably end up in the nuclear war. Second one, the New York Times pipeline story. After Seymour Hersh reported that Washington was responsible for destruction of Nord Stream pipeline under the guise of Baltops 22 NATO exercise, there was an article in New York Times recently. There was an article in New York Times recently that the saboteurs are saboteurs are likely pro-Ukraine, possibly government-trained Ukrainian or Russian national, or some combination of two, but that no American or British nationals were involved. They said there were six people involved. Five men and one woman. They took a yacht, apparently, from Poland or Greece, somewhere like that. I think I think it was a. They took a yacht from Poland. So remember, this is a heavily watched and surveilled area, because Nord Stream pipeline is such a critical infrastructure for Germany. This is watched by NATO. This is watched by Russia. So just six people took a yacht and just do dove underground in the salt water, set up huge explosives and detonated and destroyed Nord Stream pipeline. This is a story basically that coming out, that's coming out of the New York Times. US officials said that they had no evidence President Voldemort, Volodymyr, Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine or his top lieutenants were involved in the operation or that the perpetrators were acting at the direction of any Ukrainian official. US officials have declined to disclose the nature of intelligence, how it was obtained or any details of the strength of the evidence it contains. They have said there are no firm conclusions about it. Leaving, the, leaving open the possibility that the operation might have been conducted off the books by a proxy force with connections to Ukrainian government. 
or its security services. The perpetrators were likely experienced divers who did not appear to be working for military or intelligence services, US officials said, adding that the, it, is possible to, it is possible that the perpetrators received specialized government training in past. So, six people, okay, six people managed to maneuver and outsmart all the NATO and Russian uh, surveillance just got near the pipeline in the salt water, in the depth of the Baltic Sea. Set up, uh, set up bombs, planted bombs and then detonated them remotely. That's the story. No wonder, no one, almost Almost no one believes them. There are probably some dupes, but almost no one believes them. In response, Mikhail Podolyak, advisor to the head of President Zelensky's office, said, Ukraine has nothing to do with the incident in the Baltic Sea and has no information about pro-Ukrainian subversive groups. So, who are these pro-Ukrainian anti-Putin groups? Neocons, neoliberals, I don't, I, I don't know what this group, I don't know who these groups are, what, what motivations they have. But I can take a guess, just like almost everyone else, because it's so obvious. This is also, this also seems like an attempt to abandon Zelensky regime, as if the West is giving up on this proxy war by blaming Ukraine. Georgia, a former Soviet Republic, experienced a Maidan attempt recently, just like Ukraine in 2014. The Georgian government tried to pass a bill requiring all organizations with at least 20% foreign funding to register with the authorities. So of course, all foreign agents started protesting this foreign agent bill. The government cancelled this bill the protest, but the protests continued. <clears throat> this is probably another regime change attempt against Georgian PM Irakli Garibashvili after he re refused to open a second front against Russia and send weapons to Ukraine despite requests both open and behind closed doors. Georgian President Salomi Jurabishvili was in New York and supported the protesters, meaning she was in on the coup attempt. She wasn't born in Georgia and she basically, she was a French ambassador to Georgia. She got Georgian citizenship after 2004 color revolution in Georgia. Of course, after this color revolution, Russia had a, had a war with Georgia in 2008. This led uh, over the separatist regime uh, regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. So why a second front in Georgia? To recapture Abkhazia and South Ossetia, separatist regions in Georgia that wanted independence, just like Donetsk and Luhansk regions in Ukraine, and to distract and and uh, weaken Russian military by forcing them to fight on two fronts and to relieve that pressure from Ukraine. Foreign Minister, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov warned in early February that something foul was indeed afoot in that former Soviet Republic. He told a popular TV anchor at the time that the fact that they would, do, they would like to turn Georgia into another irritant to roll back, roll back the situation into aggressive condition of Saakashvili era is beyond doubt. Saakashvili was president of president or prime minister of Georgia in 2008 when Russia had a special military operation against Georgia. Russia-Georgia conflict of 2008. So what is color revolution or Maidan or regime change operation? Basically student protests that are funded 
by foreign organizations designed to escalate into wider revolution after government crackdowns cracks down on student protests the wider revolution leads to regime change government change and a new puppet government is installed that is friendly to foreign governments certain foreign governments who are inciting this protest these protests these protests are either organized by us government cia or they are funded by western oligarchs like george soros usually ngos and universities are involved in these operations and they receive funding from foreign actors these protests use students and activists aka useful idiots to subvert and or compromise either political interest of the government in that is in charge of that nation or geopolitical interests of that country to serve foreign usually western geopolitical interests under the guise of freedom democracy and human rights really really evil stuff here are few examples here are few examples should i so here are few examples 2004 orange revolution and 2014 maidan coup in ukraine 1989 velvet revolution in czechoslovakia that led to breakup of czechoslovakia 2003 2004 rose revolution in georgia 2007 saffron revolution in myanmar arab spring this is a group of revolutions in arab world arab, this is called arab spring this arab spring began in early 2010s here's the full list in in the arab spring 2010 11 jasmine revolution in tunisia 2000 2011 lotus revolution in egypt 2011 yemeni revolution and 2011 pearl Re- pearl revolution in bahrain 2011 this, this is all arab springs here here are a few more examples of all these revolutions and uh, uh, regime change attempts 2011 jasmine chinese revolution this is different from jasmine revolution in 2000 uh, in tunisia in 2011 2011 jasmine chinese revolution and snow revolution in russia 2011 2018 yellow vests in france and 2022 step revolution in kazakhstan 1989 tiananmen square massacre is also believed to be a color revolution or a maidan attempt or regime change attempt student protests followed by government crackdown followed by wider protests followed by government crackdown the famous image of that was the tank man I cannot say for sure if this is a color if 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre was a color revolution or Maidan or regime change attempt but there are a lot of similarity another one believed another one believed to be a regime change attempt is 2019 protests in India 2019 2020 protests in India the anti CAA protests and anti farm law protests had a lot of student support canadian pm trudeau and rihanna supported the protesters greta thunberg tweeted a toolkit for the protesters yes this was definitely a foreign funded protest but the modi government didn't crack down hard which probably avoided wider protests so this was over a foreign agent law are there other are there other countries that have a foreign agent law russia and china have this law israel have this law hungary the native country of george soros also has a foreign agent law but here's the funny part the georgian foreign agent law 
which was slammed by Western media as pro-Russian, is probably inspired by U.S. foreign agent law. Yes, U.S. foreign agent law. In 1796, prior to his retirement from president, presidency, George Washington, the first president of the United States, George Washington warned about foreign nations seeking to influence both the American government and the public, namely through local tools and dupes, aka students and activists in modern times, aka useful idiots. FARA, F-A-R-A, F -A -R -A, Foreign Agent Registration Act was enacted in the US in 1938 to avoid political subversion and foreign propaganda, particularly from Nazi Germany, but also from Soviet Union. So what does this mean? Is USA a constitutional republic, doesn't have freedom, democracy and human rights? Or is the foreign law necessary, foreign agent law necessary to avoid subversion of national interests in favor of foreign interests. The question arises then, why doesn't India have its own foreign agent law? India clearly has independent foreign policy as made evident by India's response to Russia-Ukraine conflict. George Soros has been after the Indian government and is trying a regime change since 2014. So if India is to become a major power like United States, Russia and China, it needs to have this law to avoid foreign subversion and political propaganda. China peace deal between Russia, uh, China peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Iran and Saudi Arabia are restoring diplomatic relations after a deal mediated by China. Of course, Iranian Saudi populations have had rivalry for centuries over the correct interpretation of Islam. Iranians are Shia Muslims and Saudis are Sunni Muslims. In modern times, Saudis and Iranians have had proxy wars in Syria, Lebanon and Yemen. Yemen is particularly brutal. Really brutal. This is a war uh, in Yemen. The Iranians, Iranian-backed Houthi rebels, are fighting against Saudi-backed Yemeni government. This, I think, you should look up about what's happening in Yemen. This does not get coverage in media. This is extremely serious one. You should look up what's happening in Yemen. This started in 2015 or 2016 and it's still ongoing. Biggest, possibly the biggest humanitarian crisis in 21st century, Yemen. So anyway, back to topic. A joint communique confirming the restoration of relations was issued by Riyadh. Tehran and Beijing. <clears throat> Here's the full version. I think this is uh, given out by Saudi government. Here's the full version of Kaminik. In response to the noble initiative of His Excellency President Xi Jinping. So it's called President now. President of People's Republic of China. Of China's support for developing good neighborly relations between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Islamic Republic of Iran and based on the agreement between His Excellency President Xi Jinping and leaderships in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Islamic Republic of Iran whereby the People's Republic of China would host and sponsor talks between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Proceeding from their shared desire to resolve the disagreements between them through dialogue and diplomacy and in light of their brotherly ties. Brotherly ties, yeah sure. Uh, adhering to the principles and objectives of the charters of the United Nations and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC. 
and international conventions and norms. The delegations from two countries held talks between period during during the period 6 to 10 March 2023 in Beijing. The delegation of Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, headed by His Excellency Dr. Musad bin Muhammad Al 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 Ibn, Minister of State, member of Con member of the Council of Ministers and National Security Advisor, and the delegation of Islamic Republic of Iran, headed by His Excellency Admiral Ali Shak Sham Khani, Secretary of the Supreme National Security Council of Islamic Republic of Iran. The Saudi and Iranian sides expressed their appreciation and gratitude to the Republic of Iraq and the Sultanate of Oman for hosting rounds of dialogue that took place between both sides during the years 2021 and 22. The two sides also expressed their appreciation and Gratitude to the leadership and government of People's Republic of China for hosting and sponsoring the talks and the efforts it, it placed towards its success. The three countries announced that an agreement has been reached between Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Islamic Republic of Iran. That includes an agreement to resume diplomatic relations between them and reopen their embassies and missions within a period of not exceeding two months and the agreement that and the agreement includes their affirmation of the respect of the sovereignty of states and non-interference in the internal affairs of the state. <clears throat> they also agreed that the ministers of foreign affairs of both countries shall meet to implement this, arrange for their for the return of their ambassadors and discuss means of enhancing bilateral relations. They also agreed to implement the security cooperation agreement between them, which was signed on 20, 20, 22nd January 1422. Seems like a typing error. Seems like a typing error. 22 January 1422 H. Or maybe it's something, it's not date, maybe something else corresponding to 17 April 2001 and the general agreement of agreement for cooperation in the fields of economy trade investment technology science culture sports and youth which was signed on 2 2 14 19h corresponding to 27 uh, 27th May 1998 the three countries expressed their keenness to exert all efforts towards enhancing regional and international peace and security issued in Beijing on 10 March 2023. For the Islamic Republic of Iran, Ali Shamkhani, for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Musad bin Muhammad al Aiban, Minister of State, Member of the Council of Ministers and National Security Advisor. For the People's Republic of China, Wang Yi, Wang Yi, Wang Yi, W A N G, Wang Yi, member of the Political Bureau of the Communist Party of China, CPC. It's not called, by the way, it's not called CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. It's actually the Communist Party of China, CPC. Many people make that mistake, and I've made that mistake a lot of times by calling it CCP, but it's actually CPC, Central Committee, so back to the topic, member of the political bureau of the Communist Party of China, CPC, Central Committee and Director of Foreign Affairs Commission of the CPC Central Committee. This is seen by many leftists who hate United States as a turning point against U.S. dominance. Now all Saudis and Iranians have to do is to join BRICS, introduce an alternative currency to U.S. dollar and the empire will fall. And some have gone as far as claiming Russia and China will save the world. 
claiming Russia and China will save the world against U.S. imperialism. This is this is as naive as the whole end of history narrative that was coming from the West after the collapse of Soviet Union. Here's my take. I'm cautiously optimistic about this. De-escalation and diplomacy is always, always better than escalation and war and destruction of life and property. After what happened to oil prices due to sanctions on Russia, we definitely don't want a war between two oil giants. We don't know how long this will last. Remember, this is a religious rivalry that goes back centuries. They, they're not just going to stop fighting because China is like, yeah, you, you guys should stop fighting. And they're like, yeah, China is right. We should stop fighting. It's not this. Whatever this is, this is temporary only. This is temporary. How long will this last? I don't know. I'd give Chinese credit if this peace, if this leads to peace and it lasts at least a decade until 2030, that is. But again, de-escalation is always better than escalation. And this is a really good move, in my opinion. But like I said, I'm cautiously optimistic about this. So, last topic. Xbox, ABK, Activision Blizzard King, Deal versus Sony and GPT-4. So, I haven't written any notes about this. So, let me get this out of the way. I'll just go off. European Commission, the European Union's regular, uh, reg regulatory body or some some of that I think I don't remember like that had concerns about Microsoft's Xbox and acquisi uh, acqu Xbox acquisition of Activision Blizzard King for about 68.7 billion dollars almost 69 billion dollars which would have been nice but so they had concerns European regulatory authorities had concerns about this and to mitigate their concerns, Microsoft signed deals to bring Call of Duty on Nintendo, Nintendo platform for about, I think this is a 10 year deal if I remember correctly. They have also made a deal with Nvidia for Nvidia's cloud streaming service GeForce Now to bring Call of Duty to NVIDIA's uh, cloud service GeForce Now which is a competitor to Microsoft's cloud service called xCloud or yeah I think it is called xCloud uh -huh. but still and they, uh, Microsoft offered Sony a 10 year deal but Sony refused it's, it is now expected <clears throat> that the deal will go through European regulatory authorities. They will have no objections to this deal. The last holdout against, last major holdout against this deal is UK's CMA. I think it's called Competition and Markets Authority. And, and uh, Microsoft offered Sony a deal just like Nintendo and Nvidia for the to bring Call of Duty on Sony's PlayStation and to keep, basically to keep Call of Duty on Sony's PlayStation for another 10 years and they wouldn't have any uh, they basically wouldn't have any uh, exclusive content on Xbox so basically they are promising Sony that what they, what users will get on Xbox will be what users on PlayStation get. Will be what the users on PlayStation get. They'll have similar, extremely similar, if not exactly the same experience. Probably exactly the same experience. And Sony is still refusing. 
only thing this only thing different would be the Xbox Game Pass uh game game pass i think uh, call of duty will be available on, on xbox game pass on day 1 unlike sony where users have to buy copy of call of duty and sony does not want this deal their the latest latest excuse is that they will introduce bugs or some something to screw up sony's experience they will yeah will be like uh, they'll give us the deal to pr- promise not to bring any exclusives to call of duty which is a full right for microsoft since they are buying activision blizzard king they should be able to make uh, call of duty exclusive th- if they want to because they own they will own call of duty because of <clears throat> they will own call of duty because of their deal with the activision blizzard king but sony does not want this and sony i think it it came out recently that sony wants to block this deal completely they do not want this deal to go through at all they are just making excuses basically i think i think there are many outcomes in this but here are the three ones the three outcomes that i will find hilarious if they happen first this deal passes in uk because it's rumored to be it's rumored that this deal will pass in european union and since sony hasn't signed a deal for call of duty on playstation with microsoft which means after the current deal goes away or current deal expires it is supposed to expire in 2024 there will not be any call of duty on sony's playstation so they are like we want call of duty on a playstation and microsoft will block it microsoft is like here take this deal we'll offer you call of duty sony is like no and if this deal happens sony will not get call of duty <laughs> second hilarious outcome this deal does not happen and this is unlikely outcome but let's say this deal doesn't happen and after the current 2024 deal expires uh, deal expires in 2024 activision blizzard king which makes call of duty will be angry at sony because of the failure of this deal and they will not put call of duty on playstation this is unlikely because uh, activision still needs to have some revenue and it's a public company i think and uh, shareholders will not like if call of duty was pulled out of playstation so again unlikely and this is the, this is the third outcome microsoft is and activision blizzard king is forced to spin call of duty into separate company a separate game studio and in that scenario everyone loses and call of duty becomes irrelevant i'm happy with all three scenarios <laughs> uh four scenarios which is which might happen is this deal fails unlikely extremely unlikely this deal will fail now but this deal fails and everything's back to the way it was before microsoft decided to acquire activision blizzard king but uh, <laughs> i'm personally i'm rooting for the first one i the sony is refusing to take the deal to put that in context i think there was a slide that was supposed to uh show up on microsoft uh microsoft uh, event or presentation event on the xbox activism deal and in that deal i think it came out that so, uh, sony's playstation has 260 something exclusive games while microsoft has something like 60 70 i don't remember those numbers are correct but i think the gap is somewhere between 150 to 
exclusive games in favor of Sony already. So Sony should have just taken this deal and they, are, they have not taken this deal. They have, I think people are losing respect for Sony and PlayStation because of all this pathetic blocking that they have done or they are concerned about Microsoft's growing uh, growing strength and side, they are siding with Sony. So this is a pro, uh, this is again this is a developing story. I don't know if this deal will pass. It probably will, but I don't know for sure. And I'll give you the updates once that happens. So I guess I guess this is it for this this week. This the uh, this week's episode is much shorter than previous week's episode. But I had to do it. So, well, I'll, well, thank you so much for listening and tuning in. And I'll see you guys very, very soon.